morning and welcome to worship with St. Mark's Presbyterian Church in Aurelia for this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. I'm grateful that we have folks from coast to coast in Canada worshiping with us, and I'd like to say a very special hello to my family in BC this morning. It's important that we acknowledge that we worship on various traditional lands throughout Canada, lands that have significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon them, and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. St. Mark's Presbyterian Church operates on land that has been a site of human activity for thousands of years. It is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, specifically the Ojibwe and Chippewa people. This territory is covered by Lake Simcoe Treaty 16 and the J. Collins Land Purchase. Remember, we are all treaty people. Joining me today are Mary Jo Wilson, our very talented organist and choir director, Larry Windrum, our sound technician, and some members of our choir, Marilis Dongelmans, John and Pauline Freely, and Doreen McCracken. Thank you all for singing with us today. As well, thanks to Irene Malik for distributing the service through our website. I heard a story this week that I want to share with you. A grandmother takes her granddaughter to the park, and on the swing set, two children are already happily swinging away, a boy and a girl. And the girl, who's clearly gregarious, says to the grandmother, Hi, lady. What are we? Can you guess? And the woman looked at the two children and recognized from their skin tone and features that they appeared to be Asian. And so she said, well, I don't know, but I think you're from Thailand. Are you Thai? No, said the little girl, shaking her head. Are you Vietnamese? No, and another shake of the head. The woman tried two more countries, each receiving a no and a shake of the head. And the little girl is now a little impatient, and she says, No, lady, what are we? Well, I guess I just don't know. What are you? We're brother and sister, the little girl said with a very big smile. From the mouths of babes. Instead of focusing on our differences, may we all remember that we're siblings in Christ as we face the challenges of the coming week together. Let us take a moment now to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God. The earth has its kings, but God is ruler of all. Praise God above all, the giver of life. The mountains may tremble, the oceans may roar, but God's presence is more powerful than the earth itself. Come into God's presence, for God is among us now. God, show us your glory as we seek your ways. Come to the rock, the God of life, for God is present now. I would invite you to join us in singing number 18 from the St. Mark's songbook, Come, Now is the Time to Worship.
I would invite you now to join with me as we offer our prayers to God. Loving, living God, be among us now. Show us your ways, guide our steps. Live in us that we may be people of steadfast hope and powerful giving. Help us to hear your words, challenging us to give you all the things that are yours. Help us to remember that all we are and all we have are gifts from you, gifts to be shared in service and love. Holy One among us, help us to be a holy people who receive your word with joy and live your message with love. God of grace, we know that you have chosen us, but we often forget that you have also chosen others. You call us to be imitators of Christ, yet many times we are imitators of the world. You challenge us to turn from our idols, but we are tempted to turn back to them again and again. Rescue us, Lord, from ourselves. Show us your way. Guide our every action that we may live as you call us to live. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our friend, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, in the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this good news we find in the Gospels. When we cry to God, looking for favor in God's sight, God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven people. Thanks be to God for this most wonderful gift. Amen. Our hymn is number 422 in the Book of Praise. Sing a new song unto the Lord.
Our story for this week is an old favorite for many people. It is The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein, or Shel Silverstein, depending on how you pronounce that. It is a wonderful story, and I think it exemplifies for us the kind of love God gives to us each and every day. Once there was a tree, and she loved a little boy. And every day, the boy would come, and he would gather her leaves and make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat apples. And they would play hide and go seek. And when he was tired, He would sleep in her shade, and the boy loved the tree very much, and the tree was happy. But time went by, and the boy grew older, and the tree was often alone. Then one day the boy came to the tree, and the tree said, Come, boy, come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in my shade and be happy. I am too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money, and you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time, and the tree was sad. And then one day the boy came back, and the tree shook with joy, and she said, Come, boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I am too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm, he said. I want a wife, and I want children, and so I need a house. Can you give me a house? I have no house, said the tree. The forest is my house. But you may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy. And so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And when he came back, the tree was so happy she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered, come and play. I am too old and sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat, said the tree. Then you can sail away and be happy. And so the boy cut down her trunk and made a boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy, but not really. And after a long time, the boy came back again. I am sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to give you. My apples are gone. My teeth are too weak for apples, said the boy. My branches are gone, said the tree. You cannot swing on them. I'm too old to swing on branches, said the boy. My trunk is gone, said the tree. You cannot climb. I am too tired to climb, said the boy. I'm sorry, sighed the tree. I wish that I could give you something, but I have nothing left. I am just an old stump. I am so sorry. I don't need very much now, said the boy, just a quiet place to sit and rest. I am very tired. Well, said the tree, straightening herself up as much as she could. Well, an old stump is good for sitting and resting. Come, boy, sit down, sit down and rest. And the boy did, and the tree was happy. The end. 
Our hand-washing song for this week is number 266 in our book of praise, King of Kings, and we are going to sing that twice. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. Jesus, Prince of peace, glory, alleluia. Jesus, Prince of peace, glory, alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, Let us now turn our hearts to God again as we ask for God to bless our reading of God's word. O God of word and wisdom, as we turn to the scriptures, may we hear your voice calling us to deeper faith and truer devotion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our psalm for this week is Psalm 99. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Our gospel reading for today is again from the gospel of Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, the emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, an item in the news caught my attention. You may have heard the story 
Ireland's Supreme Court has ruled that Subway bread isn't actually bread, at least not legally. Now, you're probably familiar with the Subway chain of sandwich shops. They seem to be everywhere. And I don't think I'm the only one who would say the smell of their bread baking produces a distinct aroma. It's one of their marketing gimmicks. And according to the Subway Ireland website, the chain's sandwiches are available on six different kinds of bread, including nine grain multi-seed, Italian white bread, Italian herb and cheese, nine grain wheat, hearty Italian, and honey oat. Now, Ireland's Supreme Court has ruled that all six varieties, even the healthy sounding ones, are too sugary to legally be called bread at all. In Ireland, following the ruling, Subway bread is now considered to be a confectionery, more like cake than bread. And this whole issue came to the court because of taxation issues. Basically, you don't have to pay tax on bread because it's a staple food item, but you do on cake, which is not. That's debatable, but it's not. <laughs> The Irish Independent reports that the judges ruled that Subway's bread is not a staple food because its sugar content is 10% of the weight of the flour in the dough, when the legal limit is 2%. In other words, Subway puts five times too much sugar in their bread for it to be considered bread in Ireland. And so, it's subject to the value-added tax. It all came down to what it's made of, essentially. It would seem that the question of taxes and if they should be paid or not is one that has been around for a long time and probably will continue to be around for a long time. Now, I think when we turn to our reading from the Gospel of Matthew today, it's important to note the timing and the set setting of what is happening. We're reading about events that took place in the week before Jesus' death, events we usually remember during Holy Week. This is the week that began with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and then, as you may remember, events seemed to start taking on a darker tone. And now we're at that point where things are getting pretty tense. After Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the next day, he went to the temple, and that was when he overthrew, overthrew the tables of the money changers, and he challenged both the political and the religious leaders there. When he's confronted by those same religious leaders questioning the authority behind his actions, Jesus tells several provocative and even threatening parables that call into question their authority and indeed their own standing before God. Jesus tells stories that make it very clear that our actions have consequences, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And that makes many of the religious leaders feel quite uncomfortable. And there will be, as we know, very real repercussions for Jesus. It's at this point that two groups of people who would traditionally be opposed to each other join forces to try to trick Jesus into saying something that would get him into trouble with either the religious or the civil authorities. Remember, Pharisees were seen as defenders of the dream of a free and independent Israel. The Herodians, on the other hand, were Jewish people who fully cooperated with the occupying Roman powers. So those opposed to the occupation and those cooperating with the occupation are able to agree on one thing, that Jesus was dangerous. And so they plot and they scheme together and they come up with a question designed to trick Jesus. If Jesus says that it's okay to pay taxes, then the Pharisees can denounce him as an enemy of the people. If Jesus says it's not okay to pay taxes, then the Herodians can denounce him as an enemy of the government. I imagine they thought they were quite clever. So the question they asked 
of Jesus is this. Is it okay for us to pay the emperor's tax or not? The religious leaders don't really care about the answer. They're simply trying to get Jesus to say something that they can use to get him into trouble. And I don't think that fact is lost on Jesus. And so he answers them. He asks if any of them have a coin. By the way, just holding a coin that had an engraved image on it and a name that claimed Caesar's divinity would have meant that the one holding the coin would be breaking the first two of the Ten Commandments. More evidence of the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of the day. That being said, Jesus takes the Roman coin, a coin that does honor the emperor as a deity, and offers his ambiguous answer. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. I think that's pretty typical of Jesus. He doesn't only respond to a challenge with an even greater challenge, but he also insists that the relationship between faith and politics is too complex to reduce to a simple black and white answer. Commentator Debbie Thomas reminds us that it's important to note what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say that there are two distinct realms, the religious and the secular, and that they require our equal fidelity. What he says is more complicated. The coin is already the emperor's. There's his face stamped right on it, so give it to him. And then consider the harder question. What belongs to God? What kind of tribute do you owe God? The Roman coins of Jesus' day bore the image of the emperor. As human beings created by God, we bear God's image, which means if we keep the analogy going, that we owe God everything, our whole and entire selves. We live in a very complex time, no doubt about it. The pandemic has presented a reality that many of us never thought we would see. It has also presented us with the opportunity to rethink how we live, not just as individuals, but how we as a society care for the least and lost among us. Before the microscopic virus started to randomly sweep the world, infecting both the powerful and the poor alike, although it would seem that the poor are much more vulnerable to this illness for a variety of reasons, we humans seem to live under the illusion that we are in control of everything, that the way we have set up the world and the economy and our societies was the only way to live because it was how we designed it. It was what was comfortable for those in power. We have rules about who was deserving of help and who wasn't. And very often those rules served to ensure the powerful and wealthy remained just that and kept the rest of us in our place. We bought into the philosophy behind the divine right of kings, which ensured royal families remained powerful and rich for centuries based on the belief that God had chosen them for greatness. Well, these days our royalty seem to be the 1% of the population that has almost the same amount of money as the rest of the 99% combined. Coincidentally, this 1% are those who are lobbying lawmakers and regulatory bodies and contributing massive amounts to political campaigns to ensure that the rules make it possible for them to grow increasingly more wealthy and powerful. Here's an interesting fact. Global billionaire wealth jumped by more than $2 trillion in the first two months of the pandemic. Many of the rest of us will be grateful to see our income increase at the rate of inflation. Those making over $200,000 annually saw their incomes double over the last 30 years, while middle and lower class earners stayed the same. 
While the pandemic has taught us that there are some things we can't control, it has also reminded us that there are some things we can control and we can change if we think it's important enough. Consider the income support the government was able to provide quickly to so many during the pandemic. Money that meant bills could be paid, food could be put on the table, the dreadful stress of living in poverty could be eased. Money that made it possible for people to buy locally and support the small business owners who happen also to be our neighbors. No matter what political ideology you subscribe to, if you were one who lost a job or income during that time, I would suggest you were very grateful to see that check come each month. That experience proved that when we were concerned enough about each other, we could make changes that would help our neighbor. And we still have opportunities to make changes. The economy is a human construct, and as such, it should be used for the good of all humanity. That's not the case today. In the 1970s, the top 1% of earners took home 7 to 8% of total income, and now they take home between 12 and 14%. And just so you know, in Canada, the average salary of the top 100 CEOs is about a million dollars a year. That's for one person. Income inequality means the poor will stay poor and the rich will continue to become richer. So what if we were to honor God and all that belongs to God, all who belong to God, by caring for the least among us, those who will never have the opportunity to earn a living wage? What if we were to advocate for a universal basic income for all Canadians? Raising the income of the bottom 40% will bring more resilience. It will bring a more inclusive society. If the market economy continues to fracture us into different polarized groups, our society will erode into continued inequality of opportunity and capabilities. And ultimately, we will end up with a society and a world that is more fractured. David Lowe's, one of my favorite preachers, reminds us, we were made in the image and likeness of God. And because we bear God's likeness, we are to act like God. Not, mind you, like gods, those who lord their authority over others for self-gain, but rather like God, the one who creates and sustains and nurtures and redeems and saves, no matter what the cost. We are called, that is, to serve as God's agents, God's partners and God's co-workers, exercising dominion over creation, not as an act of power, but rather as an act of stewardship and extending to all the abundant life God wishes for all. I was listening to an interview on the CBC radio program, Tapestry. The interview was with Mar Marcello Gleiser, a theoretical physicist and cosmologist. He is also a professed atheist. And I found it interesting that he saw human beings as, quote, the intellect of the universe, unquote, because we have the ability to make rational decisions about how we are going to live. And he also firmly believes that because we can be rational, that we have a moral responsibility to take care of creation and of each other. Maybe he's not such an atheist after all. Jesus told us to love each other as he loved us, to love God and so to love our neighbor. This story, which at first seems to be about taxes, 
is ultimately about each one of us returning to our primary identity as children of God, as those made in the likeness of God and charged to act like the God we see in Jesus. It's about recognizing that while the issues of our time are undoubtedly complicated, that we are called to hold up the values we see Jesus live, that we are charged with reminding each other that we are all made in God's own image and likeness and are therefore called to live in such a way that others may detect the family resemblance. Like that bread in the Subway sandwich shop, it all comes down to what we're made of, doesn't it? Amen. Our hymn is number 709 in our book of praise. What does the Lord require of you? And we're going to sing that through twice. prepare to offer our prayers for the world, I'm going to invite our uh, choir here to uh, start us off by singing number 449 in the hymn book, Lord, Listen to Your Children Praying, and that will also uh, end our prayers for the world today. Feel free to sing along. majesty. Your glory fills the earth and the heavens. You are the maker of all that is, of all that is good, of all that seeks good, of all beauty and truth and nobility. You surpass all that we think of you. You are found in places that we do expect to find you. You speak to us in ways that are so ordinary that we often fail to hear you. And you reveal yourself in things that are so wonderful that we often fail to grasp that you are behind them and in them. Lord, we pray that you may help us to see you and hear you this day. In silence now, O Lord, we ask that you speak to us and that you hear us and help us. We offer to you our prayers and we offer to you our hearts and minds and souls so that you may fill them with what you want us to have. O God, creator of us all, we know you care for all that you have made and for all whom you have made. 
Hear now our prayers for our world and for the nations that fill it. For those who hunger and thirst for the bread and water you give in abundance. For the justice and the mercy that you want all to experience. For the peace and the wholeness that you want all to know. Almighty God, ruler of the ends of the earth, we pray for those to whom you've entrusted power and responsibility. We think of our own country and those elected to office as members of parliament and members of provincial parliament. We pray for our prime minister and premier and the leaders of all the parties. We ask that you would grant them wisdom, insight, patience, dedication, integrity, open-mindedness, and humility, that each may be equipped to honor the trust that has been placed in them. We pray for those in our local government, entrusted with representing the interests of local people in our community, taking decisions which will directly influence our lives, wrestling with limited resources and numerous demands. Give to them the qualities they need to serve faithfully, staying true to their convictions and putting people before party affiliation. We pray for those in authority in other lands, leaders of nations large and small, superpowers and tiny states, shaping the lives of millions or relatively few. Grant them also the guidance and the gifts they need to govern wisely, that they may work for the good of all their people and strive to promote justice, freedom of speech and opportunity, inner harmony and peace. Tender and caring Lord, hear our prayers now for those whose pains and sorrows and joys and thanksgivings are upon our hearts this day. We lift them up before you by name in our hearts in this time of silence. grateful that so many of you have heard the call to give to God the things that are God's. You have lived out that call through generous giving of your support to God's ministry in this place, through your prayers and your words of encouragement and your monetary resources. Your gifts help to ensure that God's goodness can spread in this community and throughout the world in the name of Jesus. And so I want to thank you. As we ponder how we can respond to God's grace and goodness in our lives, let us pray. As we offer our gifts and lives in this moment, may we become imitators of you, gracious God, who holds nothing back from us, but is generous and gracious with all that is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is number 763 in the Book of Praise, to show by touch and word. And I would invite you to sing with us now.
life is short, and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.